we do, we've got, uh, we talked about this last night. We got this book. It's like a weapon. It's a life message. But uh, really, if, if something we talk about today, you weren't here last night, stirs your heart. I mean, this is why this was written, is just to give you opportunity to dive in and uh, just uh, immerse yourself in the revelation. There's uh, so much revelation in it. And the image, the image, man, Marissa's so like, it's like when she's doing stuff before you even think about it. Don't you love that? Talk about an administrator, helper, man. You don't, you like, before you speak, it's there, you know, but that's the image we were talking about this last night too, a prophetic image the Lord gave us to describe what's happening to a generation. And it's not just for women. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Men need to understand. Men need to be moved when they see this image. It isn't about a daughter with a broken heart, and this is for the ladies who have struggles. This is to captivate and begin to activate men, the protective instinct in men. And I, I believe with all my heart, when we connect the protective instinct of men with the damage that's being done to women because of the sexual spirit in our culture today, we are going to see movement. We're going to see men walking in a level of freedom they've never walked in before. Because men aren't necessary anymore. The, the part, of the, part of our struggle, even part of the reason men go to pornography and go to pleasure centers is because they're not needed. They're, they're, that, that part of man in our culture today is dismissed. The violent, the, the, the appropriate violence in men, the aggression, the, the risk-taking is all, is all discounted. And I know that aggression and, and violence and risk-taking is what takes tyrants down. You know, that's what, when that's employed in, in the pro appropriate way, it, it destroys injustice. Men are uh, uh, compelled and moved to act for causes of righteousness, and we see wonderful things. And I believe when we connect those, and, and God's going to connect them, and he's going to connect them through a spirit of revelation and images like this. And uh, so I really encourage you to go to the book table. And here's the other thing. I know there's people come and say, sign up on our newsletter, and, you know, please don't sign up on our newsletter. But if the Lord speaks to you, if he's touching your heart, if something moves in your heart, we need to be connected to people who believe in what we're doing. And we really want to stay in touch with you. And you can help us in prayer and just being connected and share. We can share testimonies and kind of what we're up to. And we would love that. So please, please, if God does speak to you, do that. Don't feel any, don't worry about it if God doesn't, doesn't touch your heart. Yeah, it's no problem. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't, I mean, I get stuff and you get inspired and you sign up and, but, uh, so, Visit the table and sign up, please, if God's speaking to your heart. We would love that. Let me, uh, just for those that didn't get to see last night, we got to make sure everybody got to humanize myself a little bit. Uh, let's show the picture. Can we show the picture of my truck and color picture now? We got some color pictures of the truck. There it is. And uh, that's me. And I was probably about 21 there. So this is a good lesson for young people. If you're a young person here, this is when I was cool like you are right now. Like there's I mean young people here any feel young some there's some people young married you know you feel young this is when this is when I was cool but time and gravity are coming your way and you're going to end up looking like me here in a number of years so be while you're cool really enjoy it like I was here and uh, we'll see what happens with time and gravity but uh, that's kind of what you have to deal with but I, I I encourage you to take advantage there's another one here I'm relaxing you got that other one where I'm sitting down. Uh, there I am sitting in the shade of the truck, you know. So, boy, those were the days, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I believe God's given us a message. You know, one of the things that we're excited about, this is a generational message, and we aren't, we're not going to win a generation unless we're talking about where they're living. And they're living in a sexualized culture. It's not just a sexualized culture. It's a sexualized culture that's breaking them. It's confusing them. It's bringing pain in their lives. And it's setting them up for failure in future relationships that they really will want to have someday. That's, this is the problem. It, there's a war against a generation. And uh, let me show you the, the picture of my little girls. Will I do that? See, this is, what, this is what the spirit of darkness hates. This is, this is purity and innocence. And these are females so there, you, you see, th th these, these, are, these are females that you don't see any sexuality. You see the difference? There, there's, 
And the spirit of darkness wants to take this and, and change it and pervert it and sexualize it. And this is, th these are my girls when they were young, and uh, it is, it's, it's just, it, it reminds me what I'm doing. We're, we're, in, we're in a war, and we're fighting a fight, and, you know, God's given us a word to declare. And, you know, with young people, I mean, we show a picture of the larger picture of the family, too, just to kind of, that's the crew, man, that's getting bigger, too. We've got we're just we're in a run of four grandsons being born right now. <laughs> it's like thinking, whoa, we got four more grandsons being born. So I don't I don't know how many we got there. Is that just the one? But there's four more that aren't there. Is it four more that aren't there, Lisa? You should wait. You want you stand up and wave at everybody, Lisa. You you weren't here last. You weren't here. This is my wife, Lisa. She, the reason we got so many grandchildren, we have eight kids, and uh, so this is our team. This is our giant team with some sons-in-laws mixed in there. But something we've noticed about uh, young people is that young people love, I, I call it the now of God. I mean, there's the treasure hunts, and there's the mission trips, and there's the all 50-hour worship. You know, all, we're going to do 50 hours of worship without stopping. It's going to be so cool. We're going to have 24 hours of prayer. It's going to be so awesome. I mean, we've been involved in that. I mean, when you have eight kids... I mean, I was 46 when I had my, young, my youngest son, and so I've had to be kind of active because I'm the only daddy ever had. You know, it's kind of like I can't, I, you know, I can't afford to be like an old guy because I, I don't want him thinking, gee, Dad, what's, what's the problem here? You can't even play basketball with me? I thought, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm going to beat you. I'm not just with you. I'm beating, I'm beating you, you know. So I know all the dads are, are feeling like that. You know, we're all kind of on that journey. But... Uh, it's so exciting to see the now of God in a young generation hungry for the Lord. Let me say this to you prophetically. If you have children that are struggling and wayward, you know, hold on to the generational vision. Don't, don't let the pain of the sorrow of that disappointment, that, that temporary, this, I believe a temporary disappointment, because we sang that song about he's going to tear down those walls and climb those mountains. He's, he's going to do that. But don't let the pain of that separate you from a generational understanding of the kingdom of God. And one of the greatest things we can, we can hold on to is that generational understanding of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and three generations uh, serving God together. And I, I, we're not trying to minimize the pain. I, I, don't, I can't imagine. But here's, but here's the thing. Those young people, when you see young people, I want you to do this. I want you, when you see any young person worshiping or seeking God, I want you to say, These, this person represents a generation that are, are the future best friends of my soon-to-be-restored son or daughter. Because it takes one, listen, it takes one second for them to come into the kingdom of God. It takes one second for them to suddenly alter and, and show up and begin to connect with a, with a body of Christ. And all of a sudden, they're in a school or going on a mission trip. Or I mean, all of a sudden, the, the old stuff has dropped off of them. And the new has come. And their destiny, they're re-engaging with their destiny. This is what we've got to hold on to. And we can give the young people the now of God. And I love it. You know, we have a prophetic urgency to give young people the now of God, but we also have to marry that to what I call a strategic longevity, where we end up working to make sure they can have marriages that work. This is what, this is what our task is, is that we want to we wanna give them the ability to have the hope to have a marriage that works. And we can give them the now of God. If we, if we give them the now of God and we don't give them the hope to have a marriage that works, we failed as, as spiritual moms and dads in the kingdom of God. It's not a permanent failure. I'm not, saying, I'm not trying to rub any salt in any wounds. I'm just saying this has got to be our larger vision. We're going to do it with our own kids. If they're not there, we're going to do it with other people's kids. We're going we're gonna to do this together. We are going to raise up a generation, a new generation. We're going to give them the now of God, the treasure hunts, the mission, you know, the, everything we can give them. And then we're going to give them the hope to have a marriage because we're going to heal and, and see him healed and made pure and be restored from the devastation of the perversion of God's beautiful gift of sexuality. And this is where the enemy is targeting a generation. We mentioned last night about Isaiah 14, 12, and it's describing the fallen Lucifer, you know, the, the worship leader in heaven. And it describes him, it says, he who weakens the nations. 
How do nations get weak? He goes after the place of the greatest pain in people's lives, the relationships and the connection of family. And this, this, is, this is what he's targeted to create destruction. And that compounded brokenness creates, a, he says, when the, right, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You, you, we, we start trying to hang a plumb line in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a whole culture that's tilted sideways. We're trying to, but you know, the Lord has been, the Lord's so faithful. If we'll begin to speak his word, we start seeing restoration. And the Isaiah sequence begins to start, you know, the Isaiah sequence starts with proclamation. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to what? Proclaim. It it's always starts with a word. It always starts, it doesn't start with a broken heart. See, this is where we kind of talk about the bleeding heart liberal. It, it always starts with a proclamation that encounters the broken heart. See, if we start with a broken heart, we're going to end up being sympathetic with people. We're going to, be, we're going to sympathize with them, even agree with, with them against God and God's dealings in their lives. But that beautiful Isaiah sequence, it starts out with a, with a proclamation, and then the, that, that, that spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's a, a, appointing me to preach good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to free the prisoner from their chains and set the captive free. And then the beautiful sequence of restoration, beauty for ashes, the joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that suddenly you're a planting of the Lord. You're the planting of the Lord. You're like a tree all of a sudden. I mean, you were a broken-hearted person who had been burned, broken, ashes, mourning, sorrow. And all of a sudden you're a tree. Like God's making you a tree. And you know, Revelation says that the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I mean, you go through that process, you're equipped to be sent by God to the nations, whether it's a people group right across the street here in town, a nation group right here, a language group right here, and multi-ethnic New Jersey. You might get sent to some Italians. I don't know. And then it talks about that beautiful ministry, the Lord, that, to, that, that we're called. To, i got to read it because this part I don't have exactly down. I love Isaiah 61. It's just a, what a promise for us. They're going to be, they're going to, they're going to, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified, the oaks of righteousness. And then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. Come on, Lord. That's, that's where we're, we're going to do it. We're just going to do it. And every time a family gets started with a healed son and a healed daughter and they form a new family unit, it's the healing of a nation. Come on. That man who is healed by God is going to be a dad who's turning his heart to his children, like Malachi 4 says. That, that changes everything. And the hope that, you know, that, that, that when you're a first-generation believer like me, I mean, you saw my truck and I was... I was a chameleon in high school. I was smoking pot on Thursday, getting drunk on Friday, and going to the Bible study on Monday. Ha <laughs> ha! We do it all. And we're miserable, you know? I mean, miserable inside. I mean, I didn't have the courage just to say I belong to Jesus until the Lord really got a hold of me. I was a chameleon. I just changed color, you know? It was, but God's, God's raising up young. He's going to establish the glory of God is that my kids d didn't grow up like I did. Can we all, can, I mean, really, how many first generations do we got? How many first generation believers we got here? I mean, that's our, that's our story. Our kids aren't, didn't grow up like we did. You know, we, we gave them something completely different than what we had. And when that happens, it says, we'll rebuild the ancient ruins and we'll raise up the former devastations. And we'll repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. I mean, one generation starts healing many generations. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm thinking this is so exciting. You know, this is, this is our, you know, and, the, and I just want to honor the gray heads here. You know, the, now I, I got to be really careful here, you know, because there's a lot of young 50 year olds here, you know, but, but the gray heads, you know, and, and there's no ladies with gray heads, Harley, because they, well, my wife says, wait, Jim, we all dye our hair. We, we all, we just all dye our hair, Jim. <laughs> but, uh, the gray heads are, listen, you're needed. You 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, you're needed. There's, there's young people going to be coming into the kingdom of God. They need you. They're not going to ask you if you lived a perfect life. They're gonna, 
You know, I've never had a young people say, did you live a perfect life? Did you, did you live a perfect life? <laughs> no, they just, they're so glad there's an older person that has some wisdom that wants to take some time and listen to them, like a mentor. Somebody that would meet with some young, confused person that's just found the Lord, just hanging out. And if you'll be the one to build a bridge from your heart to them, they're gonna, they're gonna, they, they will, they'll be so glad. We just do that. This is just what we do. And I believe this is part of the kingdom mandate. So when you have young people, when you're thinking about that kind of stuff and thinking about healing, you know, you're thinking about healing. We think about, I think about the confused culture we're in today. We are in a confused culture. I mean, we, I mean, if I was going to, I going to try to talk about what beauty is, you know, is beauty, I always talk to my, when my little, my girls were little, you know, I'd say, there's two kinds of pretty. There's inside pretty and outside pretty. Which one's the most important? That's what all my girls grew up hearing. You know, all, I would always say, inside pretty and outside pretty. Which one's the most important? And they kind of go, inside pretty, Dad. You know? <laughs> and I just would bless them. You know, I, I would bless them every time I, I, every chance I got, just to remind them how special they were and how important they are. That they were special princesses. I would remind them. And that, they, they, they receive that. It's kind of, you can, it's kind of corny, you know. I mean, you can tell them they're a princess soccer player. If you, don't, if you think that's too corny, tell them they're a princess soccer player, maybe a, a princess fisherman, you know. I don't care what you... I'm not trying to be weird. I, I, you understand the point. They, they're waiting to hear and be blessed. And, but the confusion today in our culture around what beauty is, because we've... Our, unfortunately, our culture has tried to equate beauty with sexuality. Isn't that the saddest thing? And then the pain that goes with that, once people believe that lie, the avalanche of pain and hopelessness and remorse and regret, because people put all their marbles in the, in the beauty basket and try to, try to create uh, movement in their life. They try to accomplish what they're going to accomplish using the power of their beauty or their sexuality. And it comes up empty. It comes up empty. And, you know, and, and I, 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 as I thought about that, I thought, well, there's a place in the Bible that talks about beauty. Or there's a story about beauty that we could, we could talk about. Where would we go in the, in the Bible to find out about beauty? Huh? Song of Solomon would be really a great place, but we're not, not going there today. But uh, it's certainly everything we're going to be talking about is reflected in there. Where else would we might go? Proverbs, yeah. And, and Esther, Esther, yeah, we can go to Esther. Because Esther, matter of fact, Esther was the gal who won the Persian beauty contest. I mean, it wasn't it the, I don't know if they were offering a, you know, a college scholarship to like, you know, the story of Esther is the story of the daughter who won the beauty contest. And what an interesting, what an interesting uh, setting today with where we've made beauty equated with sexuality in our culture. And, and you know, really, Esther, there's some things about the story of Esther that are real similar to our own culture today. But let's kind of, let's look at Esther. We'll look at the story. I'm going to paraphrase some of it for you, and we'll kind of walk through it. You know, I call this one of my... Five smooth stones. I don't know if I have five smooth stones, but, but uh, how many know you can teach, maybe you can teach about a topic of sexuality or you can, you can tell a, a narrative. You can, you can tell a story. You can preach out of the Bible and tell a story out of a narrative and then punctuate it with revelation. And that's what I'm going to do today. So I want you to listen. I want you to be following the story, but all of a sudden I'm going to say, you know, listen to this. There's three things about this or there's, Four things about that, and that's a way to kind of to teach in the midst of this narrative. And uh, I believe we can be connected to a story of a person because we're going to be called to work with people. You're going to be running into uh, people that are experiencing the very things we're going to be talking about this morning. And I'm trusting God. He's going to give a spirit of revelation, and you'll be thinking differently about our culture, thinking differently about the pressures that young women are under. 
speaking, thinking differently about the power of a father, the incredible power of a father. Man, we have so much, so much blessing has been given to us and so much power as fathers. And all this is in the story of Esther. I love it. I mean, it's, it's one of the greatest. But let's, let's get started. It starts out, I'll just paraphrase again. Um, the king starts, starts out, he has a banquet for all his, kind of his leadership team. And this is just a little short banquet, 180 days, six months banquet. It's like a, this is like a uh, cruise without water, pretty much. Uh, it's a cruise without water for six months. All the food you want, anything you want to eat, you know, it's just like, okay, you know, six months. This is just his leadership team. And then he gets done with that, and then he has a uh, kind of a second, a second uh, I think it's a week-long little deal for just all the people in the whole city which I don't know how you pull that off. You know, how in the world do you pull off uh, seven days for all the people that are in, present in the citadel of Susa? So there's a lot of activity going on. And, and during this time, it says this in, in, in ch chapter one, it's on the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded his guys, I'm not going to read all their names, you know, he commanded them to bring Queen Vashti, this is the name of his wife, before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princess, for she was beautiful. So now some people have said, well, the king was drunk and he, and he, wanted, he commanded his wife to come out and do a belly dance in front of everybody. Well, I don't really, I don't necessarily see that in the word. I mean, his heart's merry with wine. It doesn't say he was drunk. I mean, wine can make your heart merry. But he, the, I think the point is he wanted to introduce his wife to people. And she was beautiful. So I, I don't know if that's criminal activity or not. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but it says the queen re refused. And this isn't our point to talk about the refusal of the queen. Uh, there might be some good reason she refused. I mean, the, the king might have been a turkey. I mean, literally. <laughs> he, may, he may have done some things or behaved toward her in certain ways. And she had gotten to the point where he's saying, I'm done with this. You know, I'm... I'm but that's not our point. But she refused to come at the king's command. He got very angry. He talked to his counselor. He said, what, you know, I'm, I'm, and they, they, they encouraged him to consider replacing her. Not necessarily, she would still be a wife, but she would be deposed from her position and then elevated, and then we'd find someone else to elevate to, to become the queen. And they were, they were, here's the kind of stuff they were saying, Queen Vashti is not only wrong the king, but all the princes and all the people who are in the provinces for the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying King Ahasuerus commanded the queen to be brought into his presence, but she did not come. This day the ladies of Persia who have heard the queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all the king's princes, and there will be plenty, there will be plenty of contempt and anger. So she was removed from her position of being queen. And this begins to kind of initiate this whole process of looking for a replacement. And there's a whole replacement process. It it uh, they're talking about, let me let me see if I can read this here. Verse chapter 2, it says, Let the king's attendants who served with him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to the harem, into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti, and the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. So you've got this initiation of kind of the, what I call the Persian beauty contest. And so that they, they inaugurate that. They send, they send people. And then we introduce Esther in here. So kind of in the process of sending the overseers out, we've got Esther. And it's talking about this guy named Mordecai. And says he was, in verse 7, it says, He's bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father and mother. And the young lady was beautiful in form and face. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel into the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. 
And it says this about Esther. Now the young lady pleased him. I'm talking about this eunuch, Haggai, in charge. Of, the young lady pleased him. So he quickly provided her with cosmetics, etc. And then we see that uh, kind of the continue, there's kind of a selection process. It's kind of interesting, the selection process. It says, every day, or it says, when the, when the turn of each young lady came, this is verse 12, came to go into the king, Ahasuerus, after the end of her 12 months, kind of her beautification, it says the young lady would go in to the king in this way. Anything she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. So she's going to go see him. And then, and then it kind of, kind of continues to describe this. It says, in the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubine. She would not go in again to the king unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. Kind of interesting. I kind of wonder, you know, I mean, she... The king must have been, I, I guess my thought is the king was really busy during the daytime. And in order for her to interview the potential queens, he had to set up nighttime appointments because he was really busy. And I'm sure he wanted to talk about Persian geopolitics and, you know, economics and important things that a queen would have to know about. But he would have, he's going to have to do this at night. So she would go in in the morning or in the evening and come back in the morning. This is, again, probably his schedule is really busy during the day and he only had time at night. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know. But. They're not from New Jersey. Yeah, they're not from New Jersey. That's right. Oh, I'm not from New Jersey. Yeah. So anyway, well, anyway, let's go ahead. And Esther, Esther, Esther had her turn and she went to, and now the turn of Esther the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king. She did not request anything except what the Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther is kind of rocking it. Everywhere she goes, everybody's going, man, that Esther is something else. Esther. And she was taken to the king, and it says this, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And that's it. That's kind of, that's the story. She won the beauty contest. Imagine that. Esther won the beauty contest, and that's, that kind of wraps the story up of the beauty contest. So we're kind of, that we finished that pretty quick. I mean, should we take a break now, or? I have, now, I just have one small problem with this. There's one little part of, uh, of our... Uh, we know that it wasn't an uh, interview about Persian geopolitics. We know this was a harem, and we know that a harem is very, a, a very sexualized atmosphere. And we know that when the ladies went in the evening and returned in the morning, it wasn't an interview and it wasn't scrabble. It wasn't discussion about economics. Matter of fact, the whole presentation of the, of the harem was about sexuality. And it was sexuality to gain a position. The, the, to use the power of sexuality to try to create a, 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 a positive future to become the queen. This is the... And the reason I struggle with this is because I'm, I'm thinking about Esther as a little Jewish girl. And I'm thinking about God's purposes on the earth because we understand that Esther was positioned by God to deliver a nation under the decree of death. That there was a there was a a, a, a a wicked man Haman that had tricked really tricked the king into signing a decree that meant death for all the Jews, and in this grand historical scheme that the Lord had chosen an Esther daughter, and would position her to become the queen to deliver a nation under the decree of death. 
All those things have much to say about what we're, what's going on in our culture today. I believe God's wanting to position some Esthers in our culture. Godly daughters who have, with their submitted beauty, are breaking a, a, a curse off the land, a sexual curse that promises to bring a, a, a spirit of death on our nation. I believe God's doing something with an Esther church where there's an Esther church he's trying to raise up, where that church doesn't flaunt her beauty but lays her life down to break a decree of death off a nation. This is what we're believing, that God's raising up an Esther church. And the question we have to ask is, would God ask one of his servants to compromise one of the most sacred principles in his kingdom, that of sexual purity, to, to position her to do the will of God on the earth? I think we have to ask that question. And it's a little bit problematic because there's not a lot of detail. It just says they go in in the evening and come back in the morning. And the and turn of Esther came and she went. She pleased the king more than all the other ladies. And he put the crown on her head. But I think, so Esther just did like all the other girls? Or was what Esther did as miraculous as Daniel being delivered from the lion's den and the three Hebrew boys being delivered from the fiery furnace. In a different kind of way, was she delivered from a sexualized culture where she didn't have to compromise her morality, but still won the day because something had happened in her. That there was a beauty born of heaven in Esther that was otherworldly. And as soon as she walked into the room that night, the king saw her and said, where are you from? What planet did you come from? You're different than every woman I've seen. How many hundred women did he, how many hundreds of women did he have waiting? They went to all the provinces. I should be a good historian, good preacher, and know how many provinces there were. But they gathered all the young virgins from all the provinces and gathered them to the harem. Who knows how many were there? I think it's just as miraculous that God could send a Hebrew daughter into the presence of a king and because of a beauty born in heaven, a true beauty from heaven, I call Esther the daughter of true beauty, that there was another beauty that was so different than just that veneer of the external beauty that, that so many put their trust in. We talked about it last night. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. This is the promise to every daughter. Men, this is our, our responsibility to, to turn our daughter's hearts to a revelation, an understanding that the beauty, the, the truest beauty they will ever walk in is the beauty, the internal beauty of the kingdom of God in their lives. It's a beauty that can, it's another worldly beauty. And I love thinking about Esther not compromise. I love thinking about the miracle that Esther didn't have to compromise. I mean, even at the, we know that she had a, a spunkiness later when she said, if I perish, I perish. But once she understood this critical nature of the time, there was a spunkiness and a willingness for her to lay her life down. And I think there was an inherent, something in her spirit that said, I'm, I'm going to be this Esther. I'm, I'm, I am this Esther. I am this daughter of Yahweh. So let's talk about the harem for a minute. Because I believe today that today the culture is the harem. I believe that, that even though there's a story about a harem, I believe it's so interesting today that we have a sexualized culture and that literally our culture is the harem. So I want to talk about this spirit and culture of the harem. It says... Remember I, I mentioned that said they were going to send overseers out to all the provinces to gather the young virgins to the harem. I believe today those overseers went and can you imagine? It, it, it says they went to gather them. I don't think it was a beauty contest where you're going to get the college scholarship and you get to kind of travel and speak to your generation about how cool it is to be like a responsible person, you know, and 
I mean, these overseers, these are Persian overseers. They come and knock on the door and they say, it's been reported to us there's a beautiful virgin in this home. Uh, in 15 minutes, we're leaving. Have her gather her things. She's being brought to the city, the capital city, to the harem. That was it. And we read before that once she went to the king, that she would go to the king for her night with the king. Then she would be placed in the second harem with Shazgaz, the eunuch, and she would wait there until the king might call her by name again. She would stay there until the king might call her by name. In other words, she went into this secondary harem, kind of this. So when the daughter was called to, to the harem, this was, it could have been a permanent or long-term removal from her family. You're coming to the harem, and this is where you're going to be. This is where you're going to live. And it was involuntary. Today, I believe there's a spirit, a sexual spirit in our culture that's knocking on the door of every young person, in particularly knocking on the door of young women, and saying to them, actually bidding them, come, you're, you are gonna be, you are gonna be part of the harem. Hey girl, you are gonna be part of the harem. You don't have a choice. You're being conscripted into the harem. You, there's a spirit that wants to change the identity of our daughters. There's a spirit that wants to change the nature of our daughters. There's a spirit that wants to uh, imprint a sexualized identity on the heart of every young woman in our culture and in the nations of the earth. It's an aggressive spirit. It's not a voluntary spirit. It's like the overseers knocking on the door, saying, you're coming you have 15 minutes, you're coming. And you're going to be in, in introduced into the harem. And you're going to learn the ways of the harem. And you're going to take your identity from the harem. And you're going to learn the practices of the harem. And if you do that, is what our culture says, if you do that, girl, your dreams are going to come true. Isn't that? I mean, this is what's, this is what's happening with every daughter. This is, this is the intensity of what's happening. Your dreams are going to come true. Well, the dreams don't come true. You know, there's a lot of talk today about sex trafficking. How many have a, something in their heart for sex trafficking? I mean, it's, you know, you know, and you get to do it, it's like politically correct. It's kind of like Hollywood's doing it too. Like the Sex in the City staff, you know, the, 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 the Sex in the City actors are all getting together to do a fundraiser to, you know, to stop sex trafficking in Hollywood. And they're the ones that propagate the sexualization of women. Come on, like, is something wrong with this picture? You know, like, hello? And there's a lot of talk about sex trafficking, but again, I don't want the church to miss our opportunity because I, that's what I tell people, I know where sex trafficking starts. Do you know I discovered where sex trafficking starts? Can I tell you? It doesn't start in Thailand. And it doesn't start in Eastern Europe where the Eastern European and Russian women traffic to the West, Western Europe. And it doesn't start with a runaway foster daughter who's being pimped out at the bus station in Newark. It's not where it starts. Sex trafficking starts in the junior high hallway right down the street where little girls who are changing from young girls to young women because their body's changing and their world's changing, that what they hear every day of their life is the most important part of who you are is your sexuality. And they hear that day after day after day after day with no rebuttal, no refutation, no correct statement of what their identity and their value is. And can I propose to you, this is our mission, is to create a rebuttal and a refutation of this demonic spirit that lies to a generation repeatedly of daughters till they are so weary from hearing this so weary from hearing this is the most important part of who you are. And if you do this, this guy will think you're kind of neat. 
and they get put into sexual situation where they don't even understand. It has nothing to do with their heart or emotions. It's almost like branding. Well, I, I did these sexual things with this guy who's popular, so I'm kind of more popular now. It has nothing to do with their heart. Last night we talked about the devil digging a hole for himself. Can I inject a little hope here? I'm, I'm kind of feeling like there's hope coming, okay? <laughs> hope isn't hope till you describe the hopelessness first. So I'm sorry I'm having to describe. But there's hope. There's hope coming. That's why that, can we put the graphic up again? This is kind of the picture of the daughter of the harem. I see this, I mean, I've seen this, I mean, I, I can see this look in the eyes of a daughter who's saying, I, I, that harem spirit, it came to me and it said, this is who I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. This is a picture of a daughter who is doing things she doesn't want to do and has become someone she doesn't want to be to try to get the love she knows she's supposed to have. And you look at the eye. The eye is especially haunting because the eye is saying, somebody has lied to me. You see that eye? Look at the eye. There's anger. There's disappointment. There's this sense like, I, I, did, everything I, I did everything the culture told me to do. I did everything that the culture promised would come. It, it made promises to me that things would come true if I did these things. And I did them, and none of the promises come true. Can you see that in her eye? Somebody lied to me. Somebody's lying to me. And that's our invitation, the church. We get to step in and begin to tell the truth. We get to step in. Part of the culture is don't talk about your pain. The mask is the worst part of the, the image. The most demonic part of the image is the mask because the mask says if you've experienced pain or you've done some things you're not proud of and you're filled with shame, don't you dare talk about your pain. Don't you dare talk about how you're feeling inside because everyone else is cool with everything that's going on. Isn't that the message? And if you speak about pain, you're weak, you're unstable or you're unsophisticated because everyone else is cool with it. What's wrong with you, girl? Maybe this is why there's a huge percentage of women on antidepressant medication. Maybe this is why young women in junior high are cutting and burning themselves, not on their arms anymore because you can see that, so they burn themselves on their inner thigh. This is why young ladies, when they go to parties, have to get drunk or high first because they're going to go and do sexual things with guys again over and over again, weekend after weekend. And they can't do it without altering their emotions through drugs or alcohol. This is the reality. So I'm describing our culture today, and it's so interesting, it's like the, the culture of the harem. Another, another characteristic of the harem is the competition and the, care, the, the competition and the comparison that took place there. Can you imagine? the atmosphere of the harem. I mean, have you ever seen uh, a cat fight where two girls want the same guy? Have you ever seen one of those where they're pulling hair and kicking? And I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. I mean, it's, I mean, have you ever seen ladies who are really nice to each other, but they're cutting each other with their tongues? Kind of like, well, did you hear about... Can you imagine these ladies getting ready for their one night with the king? They have one night, and who, how many are there? Who knows how many there are? And they're getting ready to their night with the king. You know, so they're practicing kind of their presentation. They're practicing their, their enter, entrance to the king. And like number 167, she's like 
like a rocket, like a new, like a Radio City, New York rocket. You know, she's like number one sixty-seven. She goes, "Hey, King, hey, King, um, I'm coming to see you tonight, and my number is one sixty-seven. Don't forget. Now, one sixty-seven. I'm gonna give you an experience you'll never gonna ever forget, and the beauty contest will be over after you've seen and spent time with me. One sixty-seven, King." The king is, th- you know, he's already, he's already 166. This is number 167. And the king is thinking, next, next. Because he, can you imagine? And then there's the other one, number 192. She's a little more sultry. You know, it's like, hey, king. Number 192 coming tonight to see you. And this will be the end of the beauty contest tonight. And the king goes, next. So you have to ask the question about the king and and the design of the king and his former wife. Was Vashti his former king? This is a this is a common The king has, has, was the king's former wife beautiful? Was Vashti beautiful? Yeah. I mean, was she sexual? I mean, this guy is the king of the greatest nation in the earth. So, so the king had already experienced beauty and sexuality, and that, wasn't, that didn't satisfy him. There was something wrong in their relationship. I mean, he had beauty and sexuality in Vashti, and if this is what he really was designed for, he'd be fine. Who cares if she comes and presents herself? Who cares if she is part of a team with him? Who cares if her spirit is one with him? If that's what it's all about. But this, this begins to show us that there's something missing in this king. And this king is now being presented with all these other offerings of sexuality and beauty. And he's thinking, is this all I ever have? Is this all I've got to work with? Is this all I'm going to get? Number 167, next. Number 192, next. See, this is a revelation about men. And men, I've got something to say to us, to you and to me, is that we were designed for intimacy. We were not designed for a sexual experience. We were designed to be knitted and connected to someone who permanently, a kingdom partner in life, where true intimacy would be our, our portion. And there's three parts to intimacy. There's spiritual oneness, there is soul friendship oneness, and then there is physical oneness in marriage. And what's happened in the culture is we bought the lie. We bought the lie that intimacy is sexuality. This is the message of our culture. And men are looking for something in the sexual experience that cannot be found. They are trying to find something in the sexual experience alone that does, you know, it doesn't satisfy them because they're designed for intimacy. They're designed for a friendship and a soul connection and a spiritual one that's also. And all three of those things together is what true intimacy is about. And we've got guys that have bought the lie and they're looking every, they're looking into the sexual experience trying to supercharge that because somehow they're left wanting after the sexual experience. So we've got to supercharge it. We got to put some porn in there. We got to get ice cubes. We got to get someone else in there. We, we have three people involved. We, I mean, it gets crazier and crazier. Do you notice how perversion takes over when the true intimacy isn't established? And once we begin to look to just the physical, then, the, then we have to have more and more. We have to do something to alter the physical to make it Make it be something that, it it was never designed to give us what we were looking for. It's one part of intimacy. And this is what men today, if you're, you know, young men, older men, this is one of the, this is probably one of the most important things we can understand about how God designed us. If we buy this lie and begin to look to the physical only, we're never going to be satisfied. We will never be satisfied. We will be and, you know, as a result, we'll be involved in sexuality. We'll be secretive about it. We'll be hiding it. We'll be 
Shame will be our portion. Regret will be our portion. Brokenness will be our portion. A, a sense of disconnection will be our portion. Another part of the harem is the one night stand philosophy. Isn't it interesting that the, the daughters would be gathered and then they'd be waiting and then they would go to the king, they'd go in the night and they'd come back in the morning. That's like the hookup philosophy. That's like a one night stand at the bar. That's, that's this thinking that I, this is, this, is, this is maybe one of the most demonic parts of the harem. Because what this says about a woman is that this says that a woman, that everything a woman, that's worth experiencing in a woman can be reduced to an hour and a half or 20 minutes or some short period of time, that everything that's worth experiencing about her can be experienced in this period of time. That is the most dehumanizing, most depersonalizing, most demonic statement about a woman's value and identity you could, you could create. And the opposite, here's the opposite. God says, you will marry a woman, you will commit to her and make a covenant with her, and you will spend the rest of, the, of your life discovering the treasure, who she is. How do you like that contrast? That's what God says about covenant. God said, you're going to spend the rest of your life discovering the treasure of who she is, spiritually and in your friendship and physically. It will all grow and develop. And this is not an anti-sex message. This is about God designed sex. He knows how it works best. He designed the man. He designed the woman. He designed their emotions. He designed their body parts. And either the, Jesus Christ is the Lord of the universe and the creator, and he knows how it works best, or he's a cosmic killjoy that's trying to withhold good things from people. And we got to make a decision about the nature and character of God. He's a loving father that put a beautiful boundary around his gift of sexuality because he knows us better than we know ourselves and he doesn't want us to be destroyed or he's a cosmic killjoy who gives us this and then tells us we can't ever be involved in it and he loves to watch us squirm. We have to understand the nature of God. When I'm talking to young people, I say, listen, this isn't about sex. I'm talking about purity. I'm talking about sex. Like, this isn't about sex. It's never about sex. The real question is, can I trust God with my future? The real question is, Jesus Christ the Lord of my life, including this part of my life? Am I going to give him a lordship in my relationships, in my morality, and am I going to attempt to begin to understand the beauty of his boundary he put around his gift of sexuality? Because he wants blessing for us. He doesn't want guilt, shame, regret, loss, pain, fear, memories that we can't get out of our mind, all that promise to destroy a future relationship. You think that's what God's about? That's the fingerprints of darkness. The Lord wants to cleanse, heal, restore, and give us hope to have a blessing. You talk to any young person today, I mean, it's still, the divorce rate is still 40%, first time, second 50%. There's no young person. There's not one young person that marries says, I want to get a divorce. Not, none of them. They all are hoping this is going to work. This is going to work. These. Another characteristic of the, of the harem. Remember it talked about that the lady would go into the king. The lady would go into the king and then, then she would leave the presence of the king and then go to the, to the second harem. Remember, it was the second harem. The concu they call it the concubine harem where she would stay and then if the king requested her by name, she would get to go back and see the king. But she would just be, I call it the concubine prison house. It's like today's, it's like being the ex of somebody today. That's the phrase young people use, I'm, I'm so-and-so's ex. That means I was in a relationship with a guy and we were probably sexual, but now I'm his ex. Like it didn't work or he didn't like me or we hooked up and he, I don't know why, but 
she goes into that experience and then she leaves that relationship she goes into the she goes into the concubine prison house of today where she's on somebody's list of exes and i've talked to young ladies i mean i've 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 talked to them where they talk about their experiences with me and they and they they'll talk about getting a text at midnight from one of from this guy and what happens when a, when a daughter who had a relationship with a guy and then it broke up, and she went through the pain of that rejection. And she kind of goes into this prison house of kind of waiting, kind of waiting and languishing, and kind of I'm 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 in the I'm on I'm somebody's ex. And then he call he texts her at midnight, and says, "What you doing?" <laughs> and what does she think? He's he's changed his mind about me. He's, he's texting me. <laughs> he's, he's texting me right now. He's, I think he's changed his mind about me. He has. He's, he's like interested. I go, honey, if he was interested, he'd be texting you at 7.30 saying, let's go get dinner. Let's spend some time together. Let's, watch, let's go watch the sunset. Spend some time with your family. He's working down his list of exes. And he's going to take the first one that says yes because he wants another sexual experience from someone. Am I saying every guy is like that? No. Am I saying every man is some sex-crazed, evil person? No. Am I saying young men never get hurt in relationships? No, young men get hurt in relationships too. They're very sensitive. They have, they have deep emotions. They're very sensitive. But I'm saying, what I am saying, give me this much, that the general tendency of male sexuality tends towards selfishness unless the redeeming, powerful work of Jesus Christ begins to operate in the heart of man. Can you give me that much? That it tends towards selfish sexual activity where they replace intimacy with a sexual experience and that's what they pursue thinking that's going to fulfill them. And it never does. Last night we talked to the men. We were saying, men, we don't live for a feeling. We live for God. And the beauty of God's gift of sexuality in marriage is something we enjoy. And there's no shame to it. God says, blessing, blessing. But we can't let it usurp its way into the most important part of our life. It's a beautiful secondary part of our life. It's a secondary blessing in that secondary spot. If it gets elevated to the primary place and bumps Jesus out of the way, we're going to be running and looking forever for this this experience is supposed to satisfy us. It never does. That's why Christian men, we look at the Christian young men, we look at each other and say, guys, we live for God. We don't live for a feeling. That's a great declaration to make among men. That's who we are, guys. Are we blessed? Absolutely. There's a blessing in being a single man, watching and waiting. And believing God, saying, God, I'm a single man. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to learn. I'm going to put bank account deposits of self-control because I'm going to need, you know, we're going to need self-control more as much or more after you're married than before. We talked about that last night because suddenly your wife is sick. Suddenly your wife's mother is dying of a stroke. Guess what's not going to be happening? Guess where her heart is? She's a million miles away from giving you a little kiss. A million miles away. And we've got to get that. We've got to, we've got to, we're coming home thinking one thing and the next minute we get home we think, oh, oh, yo. We'll be going to the bank. We're going to the bank to make a withdrawal of self-control that we've been depositing ever since we were young. We've got to raise up a generation of young men that understand that. For blessing, for blessing, not for curse, for blessing. You're not going to learn that in the harem system. The harem system, you're not going to learn that. We're not going to see it anywhere. We talked about this. The harem imprints an identity. Let me mention a few. And the sexual identity that's dominated. You know, it's interesting. Sexual... Purity is not the absence of sexual activity. 
How do you like that for a thought? Purity is God's blessing on sexual activity in, his prop, in the proper context he designed it for. So my wife is pure. Been married 40 years and we have eight kids and my wife is sexually pure. Because purity is not about the absence of sexual activity. My daughters who are married are pure. My single daughters who are not involved sexually are pure. Because they're walking in, the, in God's context of sexual purity, of understanding. Here's another thing we say. It's different than the harem. But purity is more than the history of your body. See, what we've done, because, because of the spirit of the harem that's elevated, when we talked about intimacy, because we've elevated the physical part, of the, the one-third of intimacy, the physical sexual part, because we've elevated it, the church has taken that elevation of, intimacy, of, of, of what we think is intimacy or that physical part of intimacy, and we've focused on that, so we've made virginity the issue. Now, now, stay with me, okay? And I think we need to talk to young people about virginity. I think we need to protect the generation from making choices that are going to uh, see consequences and damage to them. But we can't create a caste system in the church because there are people that have been spent time in the harem sitting right here. We're going to talk about how you get in the harem. But what's our message to people that have come through the, the doors of our churches and that we're, and, and, and then where we were walking through their doors in their world, what's our message to them who've spent time in the harem? That you can come and be part of a caste system of, the, of those who are the virgins and all the other ones that, that didn't make it? Is there really a wilted flower section in the kingdom of God? Is there really a back row to the garden? We gotta, those are some of the questions we have to ask because that's, and that's why I love to declare that purity is more than the history of your body. Purity is about what your heart wants. And there's no second row in the, in the gar, there's no second row in God's garden. There's no back row. There's no second row. God's garden is populated by only a front row. And I don't know how that works. But every daughter, you know how I know this? Because God picked a, a daughter named Mary Magdalene to be the first one to say he is risen. That was on purpose. God made a choice to say, I'm picking Mary to be the one to declare that he's risen. Mary, the one saved, seven demons cast out of her. Mary, who had no hope ever to be a princess. Mary, who had no hope. She couldn't get on some plane and go to some new city. She was a, a whore daughter in that culture. And everyone knew her. And Jesus changed her, and she got to be part of the team. She got picked to be the one to say, he's the first. She was the one that got to run. And she got made new. And she took her place in the garden. That was God sending a message to every daughter on the face of the earth. Every daughter who has spent time in the harem through her own choices or through choices that were made against her. Because there's some daughters that are in the harem not because they wanted to be there. Those overseers came and, and ripped some things out of their life. That sexual spirit, that predatory spirit came along when they were a little boy or a little girl and things happened to them and they got thrust into the harem. They never wanted to be there. They never chose to be there. Things happened to them that they never wanted to have happen and it altered some things in their life. God's called us to break down, to break the prison, the, the prison doors and the prison walls of the harem down. This is our mission in the church. You know, there's a, there's a Babylonian spirit that, that, that is what we're describing. The harem culture, the sexual culture, there's a Babylonian spirit. And it talks about in Revelation 18, I want to just read it to you. Revelation 18, 1 through 3, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory, and he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now listen to the phraseology of this. This is describing this, 
it's describing a nation back then, but it's describing a philosophy, kind of an antichrist spirit that has a lot of sexuality to it. And listen to the phraseology in it. It's just important for us to understand. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place of demons in a prison of every unclean spirit. For all, listen to this, all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. That's sex trafficking, that's pornography. That's advertising using sexuality. I mean, look at that. The kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. That's pornography, that's prostitution, that's sex trafficking. It's all the... Did you see how the Lord introduced this spirit? We're, we're, see, we're called to speak to this spirit. I love the way this was introduced. I mean, this is the coolest thing. You've got to see this. This angel is crying out with authority. He's describing Babylon. It's like he's saying, listen, church, we're going to have to deal with a sexual spirit. But do you see how he introduces it? He says, fallen, fallen is Babylon. In other words, we're going to deal with this spirit. But guess what? This spirit is defeated. Amen. This spirit has been cast down. The blood of the cross deals with all the consequences of the sexual spirit. The blood of the cross. It's a fallen spirit. It's, been de it's defeated at the cross. We mentioned last night that Paul helped birth the church in the sex-saturated Greek and Roman world. Paul birthed the church in the sex-saturated Greek and Roman world. The sexualized culture is where the church was initiated and thrived. That tells me it doesn't matter how much we've got a harem spirit today. It doesn't matter how many lies are being told to young people. It doesn't matter how much time we've spent in the harem. God's going to come and he's going to heal and restore and break the prison walls down of the harem. Amen. And he's going to be setting people free, and he's going to be giving him a testimony. He's going to be giving him a testimony. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be good, and we're going to, as crazy as it sounds, we're going to take a break. Because I know and you're going to you sit in there a long time, and I got a little bit more on this story. So we'll take a break, and then we can just jump right. Now, the Lord's not going to disappear. And the, and the spirit of revelation isn't going to dry up. So we're just going to do kind of push the pause button. You can stretch. I know, and listening to this stuff is exhausting. Let me just, last night we talked about the filters. We listened to it first. We always listen to a personal filter. We can't hear any teaching on sexuality without it hitting us on a personal level first. It's like, so we're sitting there like, whoa. And then it's that corporate generational, the third is that global cultural, and the last is the biblical historical. So we have those lenses we're hearing this through, but we take a little breather and just kind of decompress and the Lord loves me. I want you to get up and say, the Lord loves me. He knows me. I mean, come on. And he's going to be doing some great things. Amen? Yeah, Jill, this is Jill, and uh, the mother of 17. No. <laughs> Hi. Um, I asked Jim if I could do this. Um, I have a book on the table, and I never, J neither Jim nor I ever thought we'd be authors. But when God puts something on your life, then you feel like, I need to get it out there. Um, we have eight kids, so you probably assume I'm a lover of children and couldn't wait to be a mom and have kids. Well, I don't like kids. And I grew up with one sister, and I never, it was never my dream to have a lot of kids and be a mother and all that. But we got married, had a couple kids, and I was kind of struggling one day. And Jim said, why don't you go to the book, Christian bookstore and find a book on motherhood? You need some vision. So I went and picked up a book, and in the book she talked about how children are a blessing. And how um, the, in the world, but, um, you know, in the world it's like children are cursed and you don't want too many of them. But she, she led us through scripture, and it's like children are a blessing. And we, we want every other blessing from God. 
God except that one, and we want it in a very limited fashion. And so as God's truth came to us, it totally changed how we thought about the issue. And we thought, hey, if children are a blessing, let's open ourselves up to the blessing and receive whatever God wants. So the first book I wrote, which I'm now re-editing and we're going to republish so I don't have any here, is called Are All Those Children Yours? Because everywhere we went, people said, are all those children yours? And we say, yes. And then the second book is called Not Just a Mom. And um, in our culture today, um, there's a young woman we know at our church who, in, when she was in high school, her guidance counselor said, well, what do you want to do with your life? She said, I want to be a mom. And the counselor said, that's not good enough. You have to pick something else. And that's the, that's the mentality of the world today that, you know, and that's why this book is called Not Just a Mom. Um, when God called us into our ministry in 1990, he called us into the abortion battle. And our job was to awaken the church to the whole issue of abortion at the same time as when God began to speak to us about the blessing of children. And it's like God is a real generational God. Um, he was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the culture now has made it all about me. What is my destiny? What is my calling? And it, we've he's gotten us to totally get our eyes off the generations onto just me, myself, and I. And um, God, you know, God says, you know, like abortion takes away the generations. It, it takes away the children. But so do our choices about um, how, what we believe about children, how many children we're going to have. He's like whittled away the generations really subtly in a way we haven't even seen. And so um, part of my part of the burden we have and part of the message he's called me to carry is to proclaim that children are a blessing and they're part of God's plan in the earth, how he wants to extend his kingdom. And so and I know moms today need vision about their calling as motherhood because the world says it's a it's a dead calling. You shouldn't be doing it with your life. And my God, my calling is to say what you are doing is so valid and so important and it will build the kingdom of God for generations. So I just want you to know there, if you know of a young mom who needs encouragement, <laughs> then give it, buy a book for her and give it to her. So, all right. That's my babes right there. <laughs> well, it's so fun to get to connect a little bit with you and, you know, at the break and interact and what an encouraging, uh, people, you know, it's, I think we get kind of stuck with, uh, crowd kind of thinking, you know, and the Lord did use the Gideon army and, you know, what, what, who was here. And if the Lord puts this in your spirit in certain ways, there can be a lot of amazing things can begin to generate from, from a group like this. And that's, the Lord likes to do that. He likes to use the foolish things to confound the wise. And, uh, so, uh, it's just been a delight to get to interact a little bit. I got to know kind of like Narnia. I mean, this is like I always say this is like Narnia cuz you get outside of Narnia and then you're standing in front of the closet <laughs> looking at the coats thinking, "Well, I was just in Narnia. Now how do I get back in there?" We were we were right in Narnia and we're going to have a break now. Like what was I talking about? You know, like where was I? And so we're, we got to get back into Narnia here. Let me uh let me see if I can find the uh which coats to push through here. Yeah, we were talking. No, I, you know, I, the guys don't really spend time on the harem. They end up populating the harems. This is part of our legacy, our un, ungodly legacy, is we populate the harems by our attitudes and our irresponsible sexual behavior. And sometimes men are thrust into the harem too. There's some imprint upon them because they were, they were touched in the wrong way when they were little boys. One in one in five or six young men have that unfortunate experience of having a sexual experience that's unwanted when they're young. And that puts an imprint on them, and then the enemy beats them up and says, you're going to be doing this to other people. And, you know, it's just horrible, you know. I mean, the enemy really uses that. And, we, and you know, we were talking about how the Lord introduced this sexual spirit, and I we got to really see this. You know, he's... He's saying, church, we have to deal with it. It's, it's there. Um, we dealt with it in the Old Testament with Hezekiah and Josiah. They tore down the high places where they worshiped those false gods, Baal and Asherah. We talked about that last night. So in the Old Testament, there was always a false god spirit worshiped with sexuality. It was usurping God's rightful place. But God raises up leaders, Hezekiah and Josiah, 
to tear down the, the high places and to break the strongholds and uh, eradicate that. In the New Testament, we see the same thing with Diana, and then we see the same thing today, and that Babylonian spirit is describing that both historical reality of an, another nation that was anti-God, the enemy is of God's people, but that philosophy today is that sexualized, that, that sexualized spirit, the spirit of Babylon that's really alive today in our culture. And again, the Lord says we have to deal with it. Uh, it's real, it's, it's predatory, it's aggressive, but it's defeated. And I, I love that. It is defeated. It is defeated. We're going to read some testimonies of, of the Lord's victory here in a few minutes. So we're talking about, you know, the, the harem and the different aspects of the harem and the culture. And uh, the fact that it's defeated is such an important part of that declaration. But uh, I wanted to mention, too, how do people end up getting in the harem? I've kind of alluded to this before. But, you know, that, that we make choices. And you know, in dealing with shame, the harem is a place where shame is populated. And if anybody knows about shame, shame is something that the Lord uses to protect his gift of sexuality. The shame shame uh, is a result of sexual sin, or shame is a result of sexual sin against you. Isn't it funny? And I, I, I've always struggled. I struggled with the Lord for a long time because I thought, Lord, I see this shame on this person and something happened to them when they were a little boy or girl. And as a result, this shame is on them, and it's affecting them today. And I thought, that's so, that seems so unfair. Why would you afflict a young person with shame? And that's a, it's, a, it's a question that's legitimate. You know, it's like, why would shame be on this person? They were just a little boy or girl. They didn't even know what was going on. And precisely, that's part of why shame exists. So I begin to understand it. Here, here God, in his creation, he has to have a, a warning signal. And so I begin to meditate about shame. And I understood that shame separated you from God. It separates you from other people. The presence of shame even separates you from a true knowledge of yourself. Three things that shame does always. Separates you from God. Separates you from other people. And separates you from a knowledge of yourself. This this sense of shame. And then I begin to see shame is used by God to protect his gift of sexuality. Whenever there's a, a violation of God's standard, the result is shame, a sense of unworthiness, of disconnection. It's like it's almost like your conscience. It's like an alarm goes off in your conscience. That's the spirit of shame. The conscience, it's, it's like an oil lamp in a car. And I've had the uh, good fortune of being involved with young adult women who live in our house with us, but I've had the misfortune of them explaining to me they didn't quite understand how oil worked. <laughs> and like they've like and sometimes they would put four quarts of oil in their car at once. Kind of like you must have had like a one and a half quarts in there. Like it's a miracle your car didn't blow up, you know, and like they're going, Yeah, I love miracles, you know. And I go, honey, let's let's work on some other kind of miracles, you know. But then there's the time their car did blow up. I mean literally just like ran it dry. And but they didn't see the little oil lamp. The little red lamp on the front, it's right there on the car for you. You know, it's right there. And it's not just girls. I mean, my son has the misfortune of blowing his car up. I go, James, I told you every time you get gas to get out, you're just sitting there. Just get out. Get out. You're, you're out already. Just pop the hood, check the oil. Everything's good. The car will run forever. $2,000 later and a new engine later, James is learning his lesson. Pretty cool. But the point is that shame is like the warning lamp. Shame is like the warning lamp. It says, don't do this. Don't stop. Don't keep going this way. The engine's going to blow up. What are you doing? That's God that gives that to us. So we deal with shame. We you carry it. Shame is the biggest thing we pray about. In young, we, we do a lot of discipleship schools with young adults, and we spend time with these Beautiful young people say, I'm giving my, I'm giving like nine months of my life or a year of my life or four months of my life, like YWAMs or discipleship schools or like a Bible or leadership school. So different kind of names. There's a million different names, you know. Uh, what was what were some of the names? I can't remember. What was the one in California? It was uh, Foundations is the name of it. 
you know, there's a lot of different names. But anyway, the point is young people come for a year of their life, but they're dealing with shame because they, they made some choices, and that, that's, sometimes that still haunts them. You know, we can live with shame for years. Like I say, some people spent time in the harem, and that, that harem experience can just kind of hang over them. It can cloud how they feel about being a, a mom. It can cloud how they feel about their marriage. It's, and the Lord wants to break the prison walls of the harem, and he wants to erase the effects of time in the harem by his Holy Spirit. This is what he loves to do. We, we've said this for years. The Lord is the only one that can put the petal back on the flower that the devil has torn off. That's, that speaks to women again. But, you know, men, let me, let me just say this for the rest of our time today. I'm, I have a heart for men, but I have a peculiar understanding. I really believe with all my heart that the pathway to authentic manhood is a revelation of a daughter's heart. That when we get a revelation of a daughter's heart and the second revelation of the war from hell against what's in a daughter's heart, and we see the pain, the kind of damage being done. When we get a revelation of a daughter's heart and a revelation of the war from hell against a daughter's heart, we are beginning to embark on a pathway of authentic manhood. That we really begin to understand our nature as men. And so when I'm talking about, you know, the, the devil's the only one that can put the petals back on the flower, the devil's torn off, you're thinking, when are you going to get to the man part? That didn't like, that's not me. Well, indirectly, it is you. Because the really, the pathway to manhood is get, getting this, getting an understanding of what's happening to women. And we talked about last night, the Me Too movement is, has created a crack in the door for the first time since the inauguration of the sexual revolution in the late, middle 60s and late 60s. That was when I got saved, you know. But that's when the, the sexual spirit got loosed on our culture, kind of the peace, love, tie-dye, free sex, hate authority, you know. That, that was, that's why it got loose. For the first time, there's been a concession made by our culture. And I wanted the church to be the one to herald the fact that women were being destroyed in, in sexual relationships. But we didn't. But, you know, it took Hollywood to confront Hollywood. And I think Hollywood will listen to Hollywood. You know, that's what's happened. They weren't going to listen to the church. So the Lord said, okay, I'm going to let Hollywood awaken Hollywood on this and confront Hollywood. And the Me Too movement, the first time since the inauguration of the sexual uh, revolution is the culture is admitting that women are damaged in relationships, sexual relationships without boundaries. Now, we've got to define some things in there, but they're making a concession. And part of, part of this is it, it's a pathway for us to... to to understand women are hurt. Women are not the same as men, emotionally, sexually. They're not. They're different. And the culture has built one of the premises that has, has, helps us propagate the lies of the sexual revolution that men and women are the same. Everything's cool. A, a lady can be involved in multiple sexual encounters without commitment, and it doesn't affect them any more than the guy's. They've been stuffing that for 40, 50 years. And it, it's, it's come out, you know, and finally now there's, it's being sanctioned. Not, just, not by the church, by the culture. Saying, and, you know, if, if we're not careful, it's going to swing from the gutter to the gutter where anybody that has m m male genitalia is guilty before they do anything, just by breathing. And we're hearing uh, expressions of toxic masculinity. and I mean, all this kind of stuff because maleness is, is not wanted. So we have to, we get to step into that conversation and begin to demonstrate authentic masculinity. We're going to talk about that this afternoon after lunch. We're going to do another narrative about the story of Joseph. And we're going to talk about sexual temptation and masculinity. And it's, it's going to be really, it's going to be the same kind of uh, f fun story with, packed with revelation. That was a rabbit trail. I don't know. Sometimes I just go on a rabbit trail and uh, talking about how, we, how people are put into the harem. I'm talking about shame. And, and so when we're talking about, you know, I talk about a little boy or little girl being touched in, a, in, a, in the wrong way when they were little. That's a softer way to say something than say the molestation. That's a strong word, isn't it? People recoil like molestation. But the Lord's helped us understand that we need to talk about what happens to a little boy or a little girl when they get touched in the wrong way. 
And that, that allows us to talk about it without people recoiling. And, and that's part of how people end up in the harem. And let me finish my thought about shame. I used to think, man, Lord, why would you put shame on a little five-year-old girl? Because a little five-year-old girl doesn't know how to talk about what happened to her. I mean, she's skipping and coloring and kicking a soccer ball and playing badminton in the backyard, and there's a, bright, there's a brightness in her eyes. There's a little sparkle in her eyes. And then something happens to her that she can't really understand or describe. And all of a sudden, the, the, the light goes out of her eyes. Do you know who's supposed to see that shame? Her folks, her, the community around her sees that and said, and they're supposed to go, what, what happened? Something's wrong here. Something has changed. And to begin to investigate that, not to criminalize, but just to, as a form of protection, is that that's, and I, and I, I see that, that really the genius of God's warning system, that it would be shame, because there's no way uh, verbally for a little girl to really explain that. A lot of times it's before conscious memory. How do you explain something before conscious memory? And this plays into, particularly this plays into the, the gay and lesbian movement where people are saying, I've always felt this way. Something happened to them. 85% of gay and lesbian people were molested. Those are the statistics. And a lot of times it happens before conscious memory. And so when they begin to have conscious memory, they've always felt this way. I've, I've always felt this way. Of course you've always felt this way. Something happened to you, and this, this began to be part of your, con your, your conscious memory once you enter into that, and that's your frame of reference. We had a gal describe that to us at our church. She was like a radical, gun-packing lesbian woman. Man, they're getting fights with people, you know, like dangerous you know, mom of a couple of great kids now, best, you know, some of the best friends of my kids. You know, but she was ra radical, but she was describing her experiences and what happened to her as a girl and her subsequent kind of journey into that world and the conversations she's had. And, and uh, this is part of the reality of that. So God, you know, that's part of how people get thrust into, how they get thrust into the harem where then that sexualized imprint gets put on them, that something happens to them when they were a little boy or a little girl. You know, the other, the other way people get thrust into the harem is just by, I've kind of, we've coined this phrase called atmospheric molestation, that you can actually be in an atmosphere and not be touched physically in any way, but just the atmosphere that you're in, just the pornography that, that you or you have to see that your father is watching or, or the, way, the way your dad or your uncles look at you and talk about you as a, or the way they talk about manhood, even like, oh, this is what manhood's all about, you know, and encouraging boys to be, at, operate a certain way toward women. And that's encouraged in their, in their, or by, by example or, by, or verbally encouraged. And that, we call that atmospheric molestation, that you can be atmospherically molested. And really all of us in, in, in some ways have been atmospherically molested by just growing up in the American sexualized culture. There, there, is, there are things that have happened to us, how we think and our values and how we, be, just because of the, the preponderance of this sexual spirit everywhere. And, you, and we can't even look at a newspaper. We see people, like, these leaders that have fallen and every, you know, Tiger Woods was kind of the great example. Like, I mean, his whole life falls apart. And this other guy that was going to be the president of France, you know, I mean, there are people falling off the wagon constantly who cannot rule over this part of their life. And, and, and the enemy is relentless with this assault. And people find themselves in the harem or populating harems, and they're marked by this harem spirit and their experience there. So that's another way they can be entered into the harem. And of course... You enter the harem by our own cho our own choices. You know we're we're accountable. That's what I, I love. You know I love about First uh, John. You know if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we make choices, we do we do stupid things, 
and there's consequences, and we, we find ourselves somewhere we didn't want to be. We end up doing things we don't want to do and become someone we don't want to be to try to get the love or the intimacy or the connected connection with someone. We, and we find that our sexual choices, our sexual immorality leads us to a place where we're in the harem and we're, and then we're marked by the hair. We're marked by that time we spent there, that thinking. And, you know, the neat thing about the breaking down of the harem is God is breaking down the, the walls of the harem. He's, he's, he's bringing healing to men and women. And, and one of the neatest things is, is in talking about the harem and talking about what's happening with women is men are getting a revelation. They're, they're entering into authentic man. They're beginning to understand, wait a minute, I'm, because when you begin to hear about what's happening, there's something in a man that begins to be activated. It's like, wait a minute, this is, this needs to stop. You know, there's, there's, there's something that, that is triggered by a man or by, by what's happening in a man's spirit. I want to show this picture of, uh, because I talked about intimacy with him. I forgot to show you this picture of my son, Luke, at his wedding. And uh, I love this picture. But it's, uh, I'm thinking, well, Luke, you ought to be happy. He not, he's, looking like, he's looking like he just got a, like a, a spoonful of uh, cod liver oil, kind of. <laughs> like, Luke, Luke, what happened? You're, you, and I don't know if he's ready to cry. But there's this moment, I, I think it's such a, I love this picture because I think it's, it's, you can feel a weight of responsibility coming on him. And we're talking about male sexuality, we're talking about the harem and men who are populating harems. This is a context. I just want you to, am I saying every man's a sexual predator? No, I'm not. But like I said, men without the redeeming, changing, powerful work of the Holy Spirit, the, the heart changing work of the Holy Spirit are going to tend towards sexual selfishness. Are you giving me that much? Yeah. Okay, so this is... And so what's happened in our culture is we've got this culture where sexuality has been elevated to the highest human experience, and men have equated intimacy, they're longing for intimacy with sexuality, and they're pursuing that. They're pursuing that. And what you see here in marriage is Luke is embracing God's paradigm for sexual experience. And sexual experience, see, God never intended a man to have access to sexuality without some measure of responsibility. Because he knew it would become a monster. If, if a man could have access to sexuality without responsibility, it would become a monster in his life. God counterbalanced it with responsibility. I mean, the privilege and the power of the sexual experience, the privilege of that, needed to be balanced with the overwhelming sense of responsibility for taking a life uh, alongside you that you are going to care for and be responsible for. Not because she doesn't know how to do anything herself. It's not, but it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. There's this sacrifice and this sense of of suffering that men enter into. And, it's, and, and part of the suffering is sexual suffering. There's a part of that that every man embraces in, in marriage. We, we were joking about it last night. If you, if you are married, I used to talk to men, how many of you men are married? You know, Raise your hand. You know, how many of you want to be married? Raise your hand. Well, I got news for you. If you are married or you want to be married, you're going to suffer. <laughs> and I got to be quick to say it's not about who you're, it has nothing to do with who you're married to. So ladies, it's, it's not, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about the nature of marriage. And the nature of marriage is that there is suffering and there is a sense of self-denial and there's, that you're embracing that. And we see this, Luke is at the onset of this. And the sobriety is like the counterbalance of responsibility is visiting him with this blessing of marriage and the blessing of, of sexual intimacy. He's going to be gifted by the Lord to enjoy. But God always counterbalanced the access to sexual experience with responsibility. This is what God ordained. 
Because he knew if we did not do this, it would become a monster. This is the problem with pornography. This is the problem with living with women without being married to them. This is suddenly this thing that we think we want becomes a monster and that we, we don't know how to get out of it. And the Lord says, I've got covenant. This is how you deal with it. I give you covenant and you, you receive the blessing with a responsibility. But I saw that on this picture. When I saw this picture, I thought, Luke, you're supposed to be happy. And he is happy. But I think he's thinking, oh my gosh, you know. And you know what? The other thing about covenant of marriage, and that, this is kind of a rabbit trail. You know, we used to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pledging myself to you and for, in better in sickness and health and till death do us part. And, but I've realized that we've lost something in our culture is that the covenant of marriage is not just a man making a covenant to a wife, his wife, and a wife making a covenant to her man. But it was really the men making a covenant to every other man in society, saying, your wife and your daughters are completely off limits to me. I'm covenanting myself to this one woman. And I'm joining the fraternity of men to together we covenant to, with each other that our wives and our daughters are off limits to each other. And then we covenant ourselves to a, to a limited, restricted expression of sexuality. Still God blessed. Still God blessed, but a limited and restricted covenant that God ordained for us so this would not become a monster in our lives.